So the title of this is a little deceiving. This is not a language store. Uh, that, this will happen on uh, Tuesday of next week, I believe on the 14th. So uh, we're just gonna be focusing primarily on the CLS scholarship today where we'll introduce our guest Lauren just a little bit. Um, so this is just gonna be a little snippet of that presentation, just give you some background context and knowledge for the award itself. Uh, and then we're gonna turn it over to Lauren to talk about her experience with the program, uh, and just some of those other language study opportunities at Florida State and elsewhere. Well, I may not talk very loudly after this weekend because my voice was shot for about 48 hours. So. <laughs> Uh, so anyways, hello everyone. My name is Jesse Wieland. I'm the Associate Director at the Office of National Fellowships. Uh, so we're right across uh, the hallway in case you haven't been to our office before, but also have uh, some members of the ONF team here as well. Would you like to introduce yourselves really quickly? Uh, my name is Christine. I'm the Graduate Assistant for the Office of National Fellowships. Um, and like Jesse said, I might be one of the people who works with you on your scholarship. And my name is Bonnie, I'm the Assistant Director, same thing. And I'm Amy and I'm Associate Director of Alumni and Student Engagement, so you might get emails from me about certain events like this. So if you do, let us know. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and again, thank you all so much for joining. Uh, so like I said, this is just gonna be a quick run through on the Critical Language Scholarship, if I can get this thing to work. So let's turn this on, small it up. Oh, there we go. And, uh, ha -ha. oh, this is, uh, some Josh's uh, animations. You always like adding animations to slides. Uh, <laughs> but anyways, I do that. So anyways, um, so starting with what is the Critical Language Scholarship? Um, it's one of the most well-known opportunities for both undergraduate students and graduate students to really enhance their language studies. Uh, in the length of the program, which is uh, anywhere from eight to 10 weeks, they like to say that the, the gains that you're making in that two month span is equivalent to what you would get from a year of formal academic study. Uh, and so they really try to be intentional about marketing, marketing this opportunity. It's not uh, kind of your traditional like study abroad experience where you're gonna have like all like, you know, some down and chill time and you do have a little bit, but, but they really wanna make sure that you know that when you're applying to this program, it is extremely rigorous. Like it is focused on the language study, both in the classroom, outside of the classroom, through language partners and through other ops. So if, that, if you're really wanting to make gains with your language, this is a really good program for you. If you're wanting something a little bit more lax and chill, we also have those opportunities and we can talk about those, but CLS is definitely not that. Um, and so this is the list of languages that the Critical Language Scholarship supports. Um, and for a few other fellowships that we work with through the Gilman Scholarship and others, this is that pretty standard list. These are languages that are de uh, deemed like critical for like national security efforts by the United States. And so for most of the languages for CLS, uh, it does not require any prior study. Uh, what, it, what it does require is a little bit of um, an explanation on why this language is extremely important to you and your academic or professional future. That's something that we can work out through the application process with your advisor. Uh, this is uh, for one year of study, so Arabic, Korean, Portuguese, and Russian, and then Chinese and Japanese do require two years of study to then be eligible. However, the caveat with that is if you are enrolled in classwork this year, say I'm taking Air, my, my first Arabic class, Arabic one, next semester I'll be taking Arabic 1B. I don't, I, excuse me, I don't know all the technical terms, but if by the time the program would start, you would have met that, that year of study, then you would still be eligible to apply for this deadline coming up in November. Does that make sense? So you can essentially apply the year before you would have the proficiency to start the following summer. And the same goes for Chinese and Japanese. It's also important to note that if you have, um, you know, some proficiency from high school, uh, or if you are a heritage speaker, uh, or if you can opt into that, uh, that year or two years of study, you would still be eligible to apply. So the application itself is, is pretty straightforward. Um, you do need, I believe they've changed this recently to only one letter of recommendation. I think you have the opportunity to submit two if you would like, but one is required. Um, 
And the application is broken down into these five different parts. So a lot of the applications that we work with students on, foreign included, which is another language study opportunity, give you a lot more space uh, to, to write about yourself, your goals, your future. Uh, CLS does, but you have to be very quick and concise with all of that. Uh, and so my tip of advice is when you create an account and you start looking at these prompts, um, this 500 word essay, the statement of purpose is going to be the last one that you see in the application, but I do think it should be the first one that you start with, uh, because it really helps frame the entire application. These shorter essays that span between one and 350 words, um, just help break it down a little bit further. Right? Like there's a hundred word essay that, that is, uh, okay, so how are you going to continue your studies after CLS? Um, there's a couple 250, 350 words that just delve into your, your interest in the language or how you came to this opportunity. Um, but really, like I said, start with a statement of purpose so the reader can get an idea for why do you need this CLS program, this intensive language study opportunity before whatever it is that comes next, either uh, you know, in your final years at Florida State University, or maybe there's an internship opportunity you're pursuing, uh, or maybe you are graduating soon and you're wanting to make sure that before graduate school, you know, I have what I need to be successful in this program when it comes to my language proficiency. Um, and so this deadline is coming up in mid-November, plenty of time to work on that. Um, and that is going to be all this. So that just gives you a brief background for the critical language scholarship. So this is the award that we're going to be specifically talking about, although I'm, I'm sure Lauren will have some information uh, having applied to other awards as well um, on, on those as well. Um, and so I think now you can go ahead and uh, introduce Lauren. Um, and so if you would like a chair. Um, so Lauren Thornburg is a second year student in the urban and regional planning master's program at Florida State University specializing in environmental planning. Uh, she graduated from FSU with a bachelor's of science uh, in anthropology in 2021, uh, but is a 2019 CLS recipient uh, for Chinese uh, and a 2016 student ambassador for the 100,000 Strong China Initiative. So Lauren, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really excited to hear from you. Thank you for having me. And so can you start a little bit about, uh, because I think it's important to mention uh, your study of Chinese before you even enrolled at Florida State, because a lot of students will come in uh, and not have a background in the language, or maybe have a like, scattered study of the language. So can, can you talk a little bit about how you found Chinese and found your interest in Chinese? Uh, and then before you even enrolled at Florida State, what were some of your involvements with that would like? Sure. So I began studying Chinese my sophomore year of high school. My high school began teaching Chinese my freshman year, but I didn't make the cutoff. The classes filled very quickly, so I had to wait until my sophomore year. Um, my junior year, the state of Delaware, where I'm originally from, offered a free month-long study abroad program focusing on Chinese and sustainable energy. So I participated in that my junior year. And then after I graduated high school, I moved to China. Um, I just decided to be an au pair, like a nanny. And I moved to China, lived there for almost a year. And after I came back, I knew that I wanted to continue studying Chinese. And I felt like that experience living in China might affect my perception of classroom study. So I figured the best possible way would be to seek out other opportunities that took place in the country where my target language was spoken. So when I applied for CLS, had it been just college level language study, I would not have qualified. But because I lived in China previously, I was able to explain in my application that I had previous experience, experience that was equivalent to a year or more of language study. Um, so other people on my program were either heritage speakers, there was someone who really uh, pounded it out with the Duolingo to get to that equivalent. Shout out to him for that one. Lots of different stuff as far as that goes. So, so really they're not gonna be strict about how you got that proficiency. It's more so about whether or not you are at that proficiency. And when you apply for CLS for certain languages, especially Chinese or other languages, where you do need previous proficiency, they will give you a free departure test. And in that test, they will assess whether or not you've lost yeah. <laughs> um, But then that's also really helpful because at the end of the program, they'll give you the same test again, and it'll determine how much you gain from the program, which is usually a lot, so. Because you participate in the FSU gap year, 
fellows program. So you technically apply as a first year student, but after taking a gap year. Yes. Yeah. Can you can you talk a little bit about that cohort dynamic that you kind of alluded to through the CLS program? Because you said it was like a blend yes. of different proficiency levels, different degree levels. Can you talk about what that looked like? Yeah. So the specific location that I was at, most of us were an undergrad. We have one graduate student, but graduate students are more than welcome to apply. Um, and we had a lot of different degrees because CLS is hosted by the Department of State. We did have a lot of like political science, international affairs, stuff like that. But we also had medical students. We had people majoring in computer science. So it's really open to any and all majors and fields of study, as well as we did have a good portion of the cohort be heritage speakers. However, it was really interesting to see people of all different ages. I think the youngest among us was 18 and the oldest was 24. However, you know, students can be of any age. So I'm sure there are locations where they have students in their 30s and stuff like that. But the dynamic is, I would say, fairly similar to a classic study abroad experience in that you're expected to be friends with each other and get along because you do have classes together, but the classes are stratified by previous ability. I don't know what it's like for um, languages that don't require previous experience. I'm not sure. I know it depends on, you know, if someone shows up for Azerbaijani with like a fairly advanced level, I'm sure they would not be putting them in beginner yeah, classes. Make special accommodations. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah. um, so it's, it's interesting. You do get to take some classes with everyone in the cohort, but a lot of your main classes are with people in similar language ability levels. So for your program, what did it look like in terms of structure? So you mentioned like the, the classes that you took, but then how else were you getting the language study in like formal or informal studies? Right. So besides your, you know, grammar and composition and your speaking classes, there's also the option to take an elective course. Well, you have to take an elective course, but you get to choose which one. So I took a film class. Um, and beyond just classroom, you also have a language partner, and your language partner is a student who studies at the university that you are attending, and you have to go hang out with them, but it's fun, and talk to them for at least a certain amount of time every week. And beyond that, they do have weekend trips and other cultural exchange activities. So in my program, we took a trip to a different province and stayed with a host family for a weekend. And that was pretty exciting because we got paired up with host families with kids between like elementary and middle school ages. So it was really fun to see like what their school experience is like and what the family like dynamics are like. So lots of different experiences beyond just the classroom, lots of opportunities to expand your understanding of the language. Can you talk, uh, so this is something I did mention earlier. So when you apply to CLS, you're applying to a language. Uh, and then if you are selected for CLS, you are placed where they have availability. Yes. Uh, and so I think there's typically, for, for, for Mandarin Chinese, there's usually about four different placements and they rotate from year to year. Mm -hmm. But when can you talk about a little bit when you applied and, and then where you found out you were placed and a little bit about that? Yes, if I recall properly, the locations when I was applying were Tainan, Xi'an, Dalian, and Suzhou. So I, maybe Changchun, there might have been five that you're at. I don't know. Possibly. Possibly. But Chinese has the most locations. So other languages will only have one or two locations. Um, so you don't get to mark preference or anything like that. They just put you where they put you. I did hear a rumor once that they tend to assort it by ability. I don't know. Because they don't give you your location until a few days after you hear whether or not you're accepted. It, it does come later. Um, but a lot of different locations have similar structures. So it's not like you're going to be missing out on anything academically if you get put in a location other than the one you were hoping for. And regardless of where you end up, you're going to have a good time. Mm -hmm. I promise. Yeah, so you were all placed in Xi'an. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, I was. So that's in Western China. So a very different experience than the other ones, which are all in Eastern China and then on in Taiwan. So it was an interesting experience. I really enjoyed it. Um, didn't enjoy the weather, but that was my only yeah. complaint. Yeah, very dry, very dry. I'm a humid weather kind of girl, so yeah. didn't enjoy that. But everything else was fine. Well, I think that's a good segue into my next question. And then I want to make sure that we obviously have time to transition questions from everyone else. Um, but what were some of the challenges that you expected in the program? 
And then, uh, and, and maybe how did you meet those? But then, what were some other unexpected challenges? Because, like, like you said, CLS is pretty adamant about like <laughs> they don't say this. It's like it won't be fun. It will be grueling, but it obviously still is fun. Uh, right. But can you talk a little bit more about that? So, what I expected actually ended up not panning out. Um, I'm a little insecure about my language learning abilities. Um, so I was really worried that everybody else was going to be so much better than me. I was going to fall behind and they were going <laughs> to kick me on and send me home because I was going to do such a bad job. Um, that did not happen. Um, it turns out everybody is really nice and um, they're encouraging and it's not going to be a situation where you're made to feel bad if you get something wrong. There's a lot of emphasis on constructive mistake making, which is where when you make a mistake, you learn from it, you don't feel bad from it. And you, you know, just keep going, you learn. You're there to make mistakes. I got over a lot of that insecurity while I was there because I was just making all kinds of mistakes. Um, I said I had a Swedish boy. I meant I had a Swedish grandma. He made oh. mistakes. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's no Swedish boy yet. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, you, you really grow a lot as a language learner, I believe, because it is such a rigorous environment. Um, because you are, in the classroom, you know, at least five, six hours a day doing academic stuff. You're waking up early, you're going to sleep late, you have like three hours of homework at night. It's rigorous, but you do learn a lot from it. And those out of classroom learning activities are really helpful as well because they make you feel a little more calm about the process. But one problem I did not expect that might not apply to all locations, but Kind of forgot it's a thing. There can be some introvert drama. <laughs> I forgot that that was a thing until it happened in my group. Uh -huh. I was like, that would be a silly right now. But yeah. Oh well, I didn't expect that. But I think that is something to prepare for because if you're one of the people involved in the drama, it might ruin your experience. That did happen mm -hmm. to one of my friends. Her experience was completely ruined. Oh, so prepare for that. Yeah. No, unfortunately. Yeah, hopefully not. But, hopefully yeah. not. Hopefully <laughs> not. Just be prepared for interesting dynamics because like i said everybody's coming from different places different backgrounds so it can lead to some drama but i don't know if that's the answer people wanted to hear but that is definitely true, true. that was yeah. unexpected for yeah. me oh, like, i thought we were all going to be friends um but let me think what else as far as unexpected if you have a dietary restriction if you are lgbtq plus if you um are a minority in the country that you're going to, like if you are not of the dominant ethnicity of the country you're going to, you're going to run into some interesting questions, some miscommunications, but they do have certain seminars during the application season that will go over what to expect in situations. And they do have resources when you are in the country to help you out if you ever run into any difficulties or uncomfortable situations. Yeah, it's also good to know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so definitely take advantage of those workshops and they should have links to those on the website and over the coming months um, should be hosting some of those. Mm -hmm. um, you also had to sign a language pack, I think, when you started the experience, which can you tell me a little bit more about that? So a big portion of CLS is requiring you to use the language. And so about three days into your time in your host country, you are required to sign a contract that says you will only speak in the target language unless you're like on the phone with your parents or it's an emergency. So you will be speaking the target language 24 seven. I didn't hear English very much those eight weeks, um, but that really does help because when you're speaking to your classmates who also are not native speakers of the language, you struggle through it together. And I think that that was a very valuable experience as well, because there's so much that you can teach each other even if you're not native. There's just a lot of like differing knowledge that people have based on you know, how they learned the language and where they learned the language. So that was really helpful. I like that they make you sign that contract. Mm -hmm. And if you, this is not like in a threatening way, but if you do deviate from that too much, they will send you home. Yeah, we almost had someone get sent home for speaking English. And also being a little reluctant to yeah. actually participate in class activities, but oh, yeah. they did not get sent home because we fixed it. Okay, good, good, good to hear. Yeah. Uh, and then I have one more quick question. I, I have plenty more questions, but I want to make sure I turn it over. Can you talk about the immediate applicability? Like once you finish the CLS experience after your after your freshman year, what did that look look like at FSU and, and how did that impact your study? Right. So um, if you are able to gain that language ability, which you will, um, 
you can, if you talk to the department of your language choice of study, skip certain classes. So if you start out as a beginner, if you're like, in, do we offer Portuguese classes? They do now, I believe. Yes. Yeah. Okay, that's like a newer thing. Right? Yeah. Okay. Like if you're in Portuguese one, I don't know what level they go to in Portuguese, so I might be like lying right now. If you start at Portuguese one and you do CLS and you come back and you're like upper intermediate, if you talk to the department, they can either have you test into a higher level or just talk to you. And if they're like, oh, okay, they got it, then they can put you in a higher level course. If that's what happened for me. I started out in, you know, like the lower 3000 level courses and then I was able to skip classes that required or I was able to skip two classes that required prerequisites. So that's very helpful, especially if you're looking to have the language be a double major or just your first major or a minor or stuff like that. And beyond that, it really also helps you integrate more with perhaps um, international experience or like domestic experiences with an international uh, bent to them. So like, it was really nice to get to go to international coffee hour and meet, you know, exchange students and get to talk to them in Chinese and actually understand what they were saying. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, like a lot of languages do language hours. Um, like I know Chinese have like a language hour every week. Uh, so it's really, really helpful to be able to mesh better with FSU's international community, as well as our like cultural um, exchange facilitation efforts. Yeah. Yeah, and I, you also kind of bring up a good point because CLS, so say if you do opt into some higher level language courses and say Florida State doesn't even offer those courses or maybe you've opted, that can present a really unique opportunity to engage with faculty maybe in a different way through a DIS experience or through a translation project or through something else. Yes. But on the back end of that, that also provides a really excellent reason on why you might reapply for the CLS because one of the only fellowships that we work with that allows you to receive it multiple times. Um, and so, so I have reviewed applications where students have said, I have exhausted my university's resources. And I can tell you as a reviewer, that's a pretty compelling case for why you need this experience to then further your studies, but three change. Um, and something else we should mention is uh, that Lauren actually reapplied this to us. I did, yeah. and I got it, but then yeah. I withdrew because it was all mine and I wasn't feeling that. And internships. You had and internships, very busy, booked and busy. Yes, so. yes. But I did, I did receive it for 2022. I just withdrew like two weeks before. Just scheduling conflicts. Scheduling mm -hmm. conflicts. Yeah. But I would highly recommend, I don't know if the language institutes will continue to be virtual. I know in 2022, a lot of the languages were in person, but Chinese stayed virtual except for the Taiwan uh, location. Yeah. So even if they're virtual, I highly encourage you to participate uh, because they do tend to be at more convenient times. Like mine was at nighttime, so you know, people who had a nine to five job could participate. Right. Um, but you couldn't eschew requirements for your program for the scholarship, it, unfortunately. Yeah, so. I do need to graduate. Yes. So that yes. is something that I do. Yeah. But I would highly encourage participation even if it's online, which I'm unsure uh, what's gonna happen. They haven't even released the locations yet this year, like the yeah. specific locations. So yes. we'll say. I mean, China is almost always going to be in China, but like Arabic, they switch countries every mm -hmm. once in a while, stuff like that. Um, I can really think of that. So, yeah. Just important to be flexible when it comes to the ultimate placement. Exactly. Um, and so even the virtual experience is going to be challenging in its own way, but they still make sure they provide you the support and the resources and the things that you would need to make sure you're still getting as similar of an experience as they can provide. Mm -hmm. given that. Yeah. Um, just given our current climate, when it comes to studying abroad in China, uh, I, I, like they have some some uh, on the website as it stands today, uh, they have some current placements, and so the hope is that those will continue to be in person this summer or switch back from a virtual format. Mm -hmm. But they will make those accommodations if they need be, just given uh, the departments of the Department of State's uh, security listings for these different countries and how those may change from a level one to a level four or anywhere. Wait, so, do you have the locations listed for 2023? I believe those are the updated listings, um, but important because they may change. Right, so, right. Yeah. Asterisk. Yes. Um, but I have more questions, but also I want all of you to be able to ask questions either about uh, the experience uh, in China that Lauren had through the CLS program, some of the other opportunities, uh, maybe campus resources for language study, um, or just in general about Lauren's experience during her time in CLS.
Yeah. I have a question about the application process. Um, do you go through like a, an embassy interview or a committee interview? Apart from like after you submit your application and you receive an email, what comes after? So there is not an interview process. So what will happen? You will apply, and the deadline is in November. January will roll around, and you'll get an email saying whether or not you've made it to semifinalist. Which I think I don't know the exact percentage of people yeah. that make it to semifinalist, but a certain number of people will make it to semifinalist. And then you'll have to wait until March, and in early March they will release final decisions. Um, so then you'll receive the email that says congratulations, you've been selected, and then a few days later you'll receive your like country slash city placement. But there's no interview requirement after you submit your application. That's it. I feel like if they have a question about your application, maybe they'll reach out to you. But the way that the applications are judged is that they will go to a panel of people who have, you know, some level of experience judging, mm -hmm. you know, fellowship applications. I don't know if they have any specific knowledge of the country yet, because you've done Russian. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I do not speak Russian, uh, but I was placed on a, a Russian review panel, and right. so. There's the, the initial review that Lauren mentioned. Uh, and so that that's a hodgepodge of fellowship advisors. They do have um, like faculty or, or fluent uh, speakers of that target language. Um, staff or other individuals that like either know this process or alumni of this experience or know what they're reviewing. And then for the second round of review before final selection, there's at least one um like speaker of that language like our review panel was a russian professor who has been teaching at i don't remember what university for over 40 years um and then there was a professor from a community college um and then yours truly um and so it gave like a pretty diverse perspective of what we were looking for in each application right um so he, but that's important to remember because you don't know who will be on your panel. So we need to make sure we're crafting your essays and the content in a way that could be understood from anyone, not just speakers of that language. So you want to make sure that it's well grounded. Right. And if I remember properly, nobody who reviewed for Russian was applying from FSU, right? It's like correct. Anonymous. Correct. Yes. Like they do. You know, I would have just thrown, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, but no, it's they make sure that it is ethical in that way. You do not review people from the institution or students that. I personally advise. Right. So completely anonymous. They don't know who you are. There's no bias or anything like that. It's a pretty fair yeah. application process. But once you submit it, it's pretty hands on. After you are accepted, you will do your uh, OPS interview. Well, interview. your OPS test, which they will call you, they'll schedule you, they'll call you, and you'll speak to a native speaker in the target language. Well, I guess if you don't have any experience, that won't happen. So, but for languages that you do have experience, they will call you, give you a like a verbal interview. And then when you get to the country, they will go ahead and do a similar test to make sure that the first one was accurate. And at the end of the program, they will uh, do another test. And then you will find out where you were in the beginning. They don't tell you. They don't tell you what level you are at the beginning. You don't find out until you're done. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Right. But it's but I think it is important to, to also remember for these review panels, and I think Lauren's a great example of this having applied as a first year freshman. Mm -hmm. Um, is it is you will be competing against first year freshmen up until like students well into their doctoral degrees and everything in between. Mm -hmm. Um, doctoral candidates are not inherently better, uh, they 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 review where you are relative to your studies, to your program, and to what the goals that you have. And so they intentionally will build these diverse cohorts um, at the uh, at the initial review level. This is probably more information than y'all need, but they do separate it by degree. But at the final interview review level, it's everyone mixed together. Does that make sense? Yeah. Is there any reading and writing involved in the classes or the application? In the classes. Yes. Um, so for my specific program, we had a textbook that we had to we did like two chapters a week. And we have to write essays every week with 300 words. Mm -hmm. um, but if you are just starting out on the language, I imagine it's going to be a little less yeah. intensive. <laughs> like probably start with like the output or something. <laughs> I don't know. Um, so it is. There are two different classes, at least for the program I participated in. There's the speaking class and the reading and writing class, and you're going to do both of them every day. But they're going to be completely different content, different teachers. And so it is going to be a pretty holistic language learning experience. So then follow up, I know you said you couldn't choose like where you go, but because 
like they write and read differently in Taiwan, like mm -hmm. traditional Chinese? Is there like a separation between that, like the simplified and traditional Chinese characters? That's mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. My only understanding of this, it turns out coincidentally, a friend who I had been living in China with after I graduated high school happened to get CLS the same year that I did, but he went to Taiwan. He was learning simplified characters before he went to Taiwan. So it might be that in this specific classroom setting, they do simplify, but then when you're out in the like city, you're on your own. I'm not sure. Otherwise, he must have learned traditional characters very quickly. I'm uncertain about I've that. been told with Taiwan that they like the, the when you arrive to Taiwan, at least for other fellowships, they encourage you to learn and use simplify. Like they'll teach between both, mm -hmm. but they'll accept your simplified. Right. That understand. Right. And I guess the good thing is that once you learn, okay, so like Chinese, they've got like the radicals. Once you learn the traditional version of a radical, you can just remember what it is and right. simplify it. At least for me, that's worked. But I don't read tradition very well. So I don't know if I'm the right person to be giving advice. <laughs> Unsure. But I'm, you might, you can email CLS to ask them questions uh -huh. like that. So you might want to go ahead and do that because honestly, I'm not sure. Yes, I mean, and so I haven't done CLS before, but I know a lot of people from Taiwan and mm -hmm. they learn simplified there. And so I'd imagine that the program would probably keep it the same across all different like placements in terms of your reading and writing experience. Right. That would be my understanding. Right. So it probably would be that you do simplified in the classroom, mm -hmm. but like maybe a lot of the street science and when you go out, if you read something not related to class, it might be in traditional. Right, that's what I'm thinking, because I'm pretty sure they use the same textbooks across yeah. all the institutes for like uh, uniformity's sake, yeah. so. Although the textbook I used did have a traditional character section, each essay being a book traditional so far. Hmm, uncertain. Sorry that I can't answer no, it's that question. Fine. I'm sorry. I've learned both, so. Oh, so the, yeah, the, I'm a good friend. Yeah, I was just yeah. curious if you could, like if there was a difference between like the countries you can apply for, um, I don't know. Well, I you can't choose the city. Right. The yeah. Person. You yeah. could mention in your application mm -hmm. that you're familiar with traditional characters, but don't know if that would yeah. affect where you end up. Because someone in our cohort had lived, two people in our cohort had lived in Taiwan previously and they still ended up mm -hmm. a, so, on yeah. the mainland. Yeah. CLS. So, CLS <laughs> doesn't provide you that level of flexibility, but other fellowships. Um, I know we just talked about this, uh, but uh, like the Born Scholarship, which we'll talk more about uh, on our presentation on the 14th, um, does allow you to find a very specific university or program, and this is why I want to participate in this program. And so, so there are awards that have a level of flexibility. And I, but I guess the nice thing with CLS is that you don't have to worry about that. You just apply to the language, and then you will find out where you're going. And so it removes a lot of that stress. At least. I was wondering what was the relative size of like the cohorts that you, or maybe just yours if you didn't know about others. I believe we were 22. I okay. believe there were 22 of us. And that seems to be between 20 and 30. I imagine for other languages it might be smaller. Because like, mm -hmm. like I cannot tell you what the Ashokajani cohort size would be. Yeah. I have no idea. But my cohort was 22. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, when do you recommend that we like start the application process yeah. <laughs> right now yeah, and yeah. i owe him my life so <laughs> if you are interested in having a fantastic advisor go ahead and email him a -E or our other advisors yes. that are equally <laughs> one yes, that are sitting in the back. <laughs> yes perfect but, i don't know their emails though so. yeah we will uh we can share those at the end um yeah but Usually for any fellowship application, this is not, it, it varies depending on the award, at least a month uh, is like really helpful, but the more time you can give yourself, the better. Um, so this is a, a mid to late November. I might've seen November 27th this year, which is a little bit later than it has been in years past. Mm -hmm. But regardless, um, uh, we also have a campus deadline for Boren, that's December 1st. Uh, and so everything is gonna be due sooner than you than you think. Um, and I think to remove as much stress as possible, we want to make sure that, especially for CLS, mm -hmm. that we can break down the application in chunks. So it's not like, all right, send me all five of your essays, but we can start one by one uh, and slowly add on to that. But also make sure that you give your recommendation letter writer or writers, you know, uh, something that's one or two, um, 
make sure you give them at least enough time, like a, usually a month uh, to write their letters, just give them a heads up. Um, but yeah, so it's never too early to get started. And we're right now still recruiting, uh, but we may also find other language fellowships that you might be interested in and eligible for. Um, so CLS is a small piece of a much larger pie. Okay. Yeah. There's so many fellowships. Yeah. What kinds of reasons to pursue the language study do they <laughs> deem as valuable? Like, for example, like I am Turkish, but not a heritage speaker. Like if I put my application around, it's like, oh, I want to culturally connect with my own heritage. Would that not be a good thing to write essays about because it's not career led or? That might be a better question. So, it's so typically uh, a personal connection to the language is absolutely fine, but you don't want that to be the sole connection to the language. And so, if it is, if it is really important to personally reconnect and explore that side of yourself, absolutely, you should mention that. But I think the most one of the most important things, and obviously this is vague and can be malleable, but they, like CLS, Boren, Bulbra, all these, they want to see longevity. And so they want to understand that this isn't going to be a, all right, I go study this language for um, a summer and I have unlocked this new level of myself. And now I'm done with the language. I'm not obviously not saying that you're you know, but but they want to make sure that you can give them some tangible connections. So either through future coursework that you might be participating in, uh, future internships, maybe there are some groups or organizations that you're wanting to volunteer with. Um, you know, it's students have used, you know, uh, anything from like humanitarian efforts and reasons for why they're wanting to study the language to really like stem like research focus, you know, like this is I had a student that applied to Japanese and talked about specific fellowships and graduate opportunities in Japan that they were wanting to apply to following increase. So you can get as specific as you want to be, but you want to try to convince the committee that, okay, so if we give you this little tiny pot of gold, you know, to go do the summer opportunity, that our return on investment is that we are getting a future scholar or academic or, um, you know, maybe future ambassador for the United States, you know, again, whatever that looks like for you. So just longevity is what I would say. Thank you. Yeah. And I also think a significant portion of the application is you need to convince them why they want you rather than why you want the program, which like I found it very difficult because I don't like to like promote myself, but you have to get into that mindset yeah. of being like, here's why you should want me uh, rather than here's why I really, really want to go study this language. And like mm -hmm. Jesse said, it really is very you can find a connection i i rest assured someone in my program who was like a future you know what's that called medical student going to oh like doctors or like or just med, med she, she was going med to med student. school yeah. um her reasoning was that the area she lives in has a lot of chinese senior citizens and she wanted to be able to better communicate with them because she did not know a lot of Chinese and wanted to be able to yeah. better serve her community and that yeah. worked. She got accepted. Yeah. So a lot of different things. I think one thing I would advise against is doing something very, I don't want to say generic, but they're probably going to get like several hundred applications saying, I want to be a diplomat. That's it. You know, like, so maybe try to explain why you're the best choice of the 500 people who want to be diplomats. Yeah. Because everyone can say they're passionate about language study and everyone can say that they want to like, I, I want to be a better speaker, you know, or if just saying diplomacy, that can mean a million different things to a million different people. So you really have to like break it. It's okay if you start there, but then you need to break it down further. Yeah. Um, I had a question about the language evaluation that they um, kind of put you through. Um, because for the Fulbright, you have someone from campus to evaluate whether you're, you know, prepared to participate in, in, in the country that you selected. So um, do they need that sort of proof or is it just kind of self-identified? I, I did, you know, I, I do have something, of, you know, equivalent to the experience of having studied for two years of this certain language. I'm applying to Japanese. So just, yeah, so when you are filling out the application you self-assess mm -hmm. and so when i applied i hit the little intermediate button and called it a day and is there a section where you explain if if you don't have the transcripts like I, they do provide like a little caveat in the application but but like lauren was saying earlier like 
they will suss you out if you didn't, didn't you know. Right, <laughs> yeah, because then you're going to get a phone call and yeah. they're going to start speaking the target language. And if you're like, what are you saying? And you're like, okay, maybe yeah. Yeah. you were lying. Trial by fire. <laughs> exactly. But so when you fill out the application, you don't have to provide any proof. Uh, but when they call you for that phone interview, it will become apparent what your language is. Yeah. Uh, but that, like you said, that doesn't happen until like mid to late spring. Yeah. You know, so you, it's like you still have time. So like I was saying earlier, it's like if you are taking, if you're starting your language study, say for like Arabic, you will have this fall and most of next spring to get to that beginner proficiency before that would even happen if you are selected. That's yeah, actually so, what happened so. to me. I hit the little intermediate button, but by the time I have the phone interview, they placed me in advance. So mm -hmm. you never know. Yeah. Sometimes you win. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to know, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'd like to know a little bit about like the integration to the country. Like if you were on dorms, if you felt the liberty to engage with the outside community, or you felt restricted abroad in terms of what state um set you up with. Right. So most CLS programs have you placed with host families. I was in one of the exceptions. We lived in wasn't even a dorm, we lived in a hotel. Yeah. <laughs> um, but we did have a roommate who spoke the target language. So my roommate was a student at the university. Um, but most like locations will put you with a host family and they will be sure to screen the host families to make sure that you're not going to run into any <laughs> issues, especially for you know individuals who might have identities that are less common in the country. So I think. Personally, I personally am glad that I wasn't placed with a host family because I was kind of host familyed out after living in China for almost a year. I was like, I don't want to, I don't want to, because the host family sometimes do have children. And I was like, I've been around a 10 year old long enough. I don't think that again. But that was just my personal experience. So I feel like the host family definitely also offers um, a very, like a very, I don't want to say like authentic, but it does offer a very. Is that something you get in the classroom? Exactly. And if you live with a host family, they provide most of your meals. If you live in a dormitory or hotel, CLS will pay for your little meal card mm -hmm. in the, in the um, what is that called? The dining hall. Yes, the dining hall. <laughs> so either way, the program is almost entirely funded. Like you're getting an entire experience completely for free. But yes, most of the time you live in a host family. There's only a few locations where you live in a dorm or something like that. Yeah. So I would say the integration aspect is really, um, I'm losing my words today. The integration aspect is really there. Like you're going to have a, like a really, uh, integrated experience with the host country. And then when you go on those little weekend trips, they will also be opportunities for you to better engage with the culture. I mean, I can't speak for other locations, but we did a trip to a neighboring province. We did a trip to a movie studio. We did all kinds of interesting stuff. So really fun stuff. Did you receive a stipend? Yes. I think it was $800 for China. It, it matches the cost of living in the host country, and it's meant to be enough to sustain your your cost of living needs outside of accommodation. And of course, if if there are not just for CLS for any fellowship, if there are things that you need, or if there are accommodations that you need, or if there are challenges that you that just arise, like they provide you resources to be able to speak up and advocate for yourself so that you can make adjustments. So right. like if the home placement is not like a best the best situation for you, it's like don't just sit through that for the next two months. Like you, they you can reach out to CLS and communicate with them. Right. Absolutely. I did forget to mention that the flight to the host country is covered as well as your there's a there's an orientation in Washington DC and they will pay for you to get to Washington DC. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, and I guess this would be more question for Jesse because you had the in-person experience. But how are they? And I'm applying for China specifically, so obviously I'm concerned whether it be in-person or online experience. 
You know how they're trying to replicate that immersion for online experience versus in person? Yeah, um, I mean, they, they're trying to also balance, like obviously you'll be taking your virtual classes, but you'll also have time and conversations with your partner and other people that you're placed with. Um, obviously there's only so much they can do when it comes to cultural immersion, like, you know, through a through a computer screen. Um, but uh, it's, there's, there's if you're, so you'll still get the gains in the language. And so if you're thinking more long-term, there's still, you're still gonna be a CLS scholar. You're still gonna grow in your proficiency and that may opt you into other experiences. Obviously we would like for you to be in person for all of these experiences as you know things start to reopen. Um, but if, again, if that's the, maybe, maybe that's another reason to, you know, okay, so maybe let me consider a CLS application. You know, and, and then if I am placed in one of the virtual opportunities, uh, you know, maybe uh, to anticipate that, maybe I could also consider other in-person experiences or fellowships that, you know, say if I am placed with a with a virtual CLS, but say I also receive this other fellowship or this international experience, maybe I'm going to go do that for right now. Because at the end of the day, you know, it's like if you're still growing your language proficiency, you're still engaging across culture, like. Like CLS is one amazing way to do that, but there are so many others. Um, and so like we mentioned, so uh, the workshop we're having on the 14th, if you would like to learn about some of those, uh, those others, or if you're already meeting with advisor, you know, a lot of those deadlines are in fall, but then Florida State also has some resources for undergraduates through social science scholars, through the Mueller Shift program, through other, you know, just international programs, global exchanges, you know, to still have a similar experience. Mm -hmm. Um, and so we, depending on your situation, we can find opportunities for you. Um, but I think the best way to kind of ensure that you have something is to kind of hedge your bets and maybe put out a few applications to a few different programs. Uh, but the hope is that everything will be in person uh, for this coming summer. Thank you. And Michael, I think you might specifically be interested in foreign. Are you doing research with the Department of Modern Language? So I graduated already. So I'm technically an alumni right now. Yeah, but I, I'm also I'm in the process of applying for PhD in other places that I'll start next fall. Oh, okay. okay. So the foreign fellowship for graduate students mm -hmm. allows you to do research. So if you do research, that might be of interest to you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but a lot of different fellowships, lots mm -hmm. of them. So yeah. Many. Yeah. Um, I mean, for Gilman is undergraduate. Right. So the Gilman Scholarship is for undergraduate Pell recipients, but also provides an opportunity for language study. Right. So, so mm -hmm. lots of different opportunities. CLS will not be your only option for studying language. So I would highly yeah. recommend meeting with the LNF to discuss your options. What workshop on the 14th? Sorry. Yeah. So we're doing a language studies workshop. I believe it's from 4 to 5 p.m. on September 14th, but please feel free to double it's check me. But we'll be having a virtual option as well as it should be in uh, 3008, so just the classroom right next door. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And how are you doing on time? Yeah. It's 1148. So okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have, so I, I, if you do have classes, I know Alexis had to let you know, but please feel free to head out. But we have time for a few more questions. Oh, we forgot to mention one of the biggest perks of CLS is after you are done for a certain number of years, you don't remember how many, you are given oh, the, the non competitive. Um, if you're like looking for basically, uh, if you want to work for the federal government, you get preferential right. hiring. Yeah. And I think it lasts for two years, but if you go to grad school or you're not going to be graduating in two years, they extend so. it. Yeah. Mine expired. Yeah. For sure. But yeah, yeah. you get preferential hiring treatment. I think we just get to skip the first part of the application course. I don't know exactly how it works, yeah. but you do get preferential hiring for positions mm -hmm. with the federal government. So mm -hmm. you're looking at that. That's good yeah. And the classes can count for academic credit through Bryn Mawr, at least for my yeah. for my program, it was through Bryn Mawr, so it can count as transfer credit. I got mm -hmm. six. That. Did you have the option to not accept it if you yes. wanted to? So it's like depending on where you are in your academic journey, you right. know, the, that credit counter is real, I know. Exactly. But, yeah. Yeah. Or if you don't yeah. do a great job. <laughs> I'll send that with the shoes. Yeah. If you don't do a good job, I don't think anybody in my work failed or anything like that. Right. But, yeah. Uh, or if you're like, you don't want the pressure, you can opt out of academic right. credit if you're like, listen, I'm just here for personal growth. And I might fail a few tests. Right. That might be best. But at the end, you'll right. still have a higher position. Exactly. So, yeah. Yeah. Lots of benefits from the program. I'm very grateful that I got to participate in 2019. Yeah. Any 
the question. It's exclusively a summer experience, correct? For CLS. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But other experiences, Gilman is also. Uh, so Gilman is flexible to fall, spring, or summer, but there's also a new and 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 I I don't I don't know if you know about this one yet, but like the CLS program actually created a new award called CLS Spark, um, which is it was last year was like well sorry last spring was like the first time it existed, and so they're still working out the kinks. Um, but it was a purely virtual opportunity, but it was created for Chinese, Russian, and Arabic. Um, purely to provide access for students who may otherwise not have it. So that was like their main review criteria for students who maybe didn't have the resources or I had students who weren't allowed to take courses if it wasn't within their major. Um, and so if you do, so like I said, it is purely virtual, but if you do participate in that program, um, you do get preferred selection if you apply to CLS the following semester. Uh, so you kind of skip the first round of review. And I think it was for, for Chinese, it required one year of study, which is different from the two years. Uh, and then for Arabic and Russian, which is normally one year of study, it, it, it didn't require any. So there were some like unique caveats, um, but, uh, but that's just another way CLS is trying to become more accessible to all students um, and to really get more students to be eligible for those uh, the languages that require prior studies. So. And there are another CLS refresh is for oh, true. people who yeah. did that. Yeah. Yes. yes. For people who already did CLS, but it is an opportunity to, in a virtual setting, continue your study. And that's also completely free. So, and then you have access to a CLS alumni resource. No. Uh, yeah. Right. Like there's there's a lot of resources online for CLS alumni. So I would highly recommend it if you're looking for all kinds of different perks and benefits. Any other final questions? Perfect. Thank you all so much for coming. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Yes, for being here. my <laughs> pleasure. Yeah. Well, we'll hang out for a few more minutes. You know, so if you do have any final thoughts or would like to ask either Lauren or myself, we'd be happy to answer those. But otherwise, we have our workshop on the 14th. Please feel free to come. Uh, we'll be focusing specifically on some undergraduate fellowships for language study. Um, or feel free to connect with Bonnie and myself. Um, Amy's fantastic too, but just doesn't advise fellowships. Um, but uh, you know, get to know her. But, but at Wolf Hub, if you have friends um, that might be interested, or if you're also interested in just learning about another fellowship, tomorrow on Zoom at two, we're going to be talking about the Goldwater. So same kind of concept. We're going to have another alumni who for STEM Gold... fellowship. Yeah, and yes, that's for yes, STEM. Yeah. So it's totally different than language, but if but you have any important. friends who are STEM focused or you're interested in learning more, join us tomorrow too. Yeah. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.